I came to the debate on constitutional recognition from my deep interest in constitutional history and constitutional law. In my maiden speech to Parliament, I spoke of asking my parents for a copy of Australia's constitution for my 10th birthday, definitely earning me the moniker Nerdus Maximus. I've been involved in constitutional battles past, most notably the 1998 Constitutional Convention and as a member of the official No Case Committee during the Republic referendum. We have a constitution that is the envy of the world. The constitution's the invisible pillar that holds our great national uh, endeavour together. A document devoid of poetic or symbolic language, it's a practical, clear and concise enough document to fit in your pocket. And yet it was developed over a decade of negotiation and detailed debate and compromise. Our constitution has stood the, st the test of time. It is sadly an under-celebrated achievement that we are one of the oldest continuous democracies in the world. While the framers of our constitution were not perfect, they got a lot of things right. My interest in constitutional recognition was piqued in 2014 by the decision of the then Prime Minister Tony Abbott when he was elected to office to put constitutional recognition back on the agenda. I had concerns about his approach because I don't believe the constitution is a place for symbolic and historic language. I believe there are legal risks in using such language. And so my friend Damien Freeman and I began the work on an idea with which we could recognise the place of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in our national life without the need for a constitutional amendment. The result was our idea of a non-constitutional Australian Declaration of Recognition. That, that document could be developed by Australians, affirmed at a national plebiscite and used in schools and parliaments across our civic, social and sporting life. It could say so much more because it wasn't tied down by the risks of judicial interpretation. At the time we were developing this idea, Noel Pearson was trying to work out a way to encourage constitutional conservatives to work with Indigenous leaders to advance constitutional recognition that both could support. We started to listen, to talk, to argue, to engage with each other to try and find common ground. Noel's proposal was for a national voice to advise on policies and laws affecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. I support the idea of a voice because as a Liberal I believe in the dignity of the individual. I believe better policy is made when the people directly affected by the policy are consulted on that policy. As a Conservative, I believe in the principle of subsidiarity. I believe through empowering people, building institutions and shifting responsibility and decision-making closer to people and local communities, we're more likely to be successful in shifting the dial on Indigenous affairs. The result of that engagement was a package of reforms that we put to Prime Minister Abbott. The Declaration of Recognition, the rewording of the races power in the Constitution to become an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders power, the removal of the spent race-based provision in Section 25 of the Constitution, and a voice proposal which Noel had devised and workshopped over several months with Greg Craven, Anne Toomey, Damien Freeman and myself. Anne Toomey was the principal draftsperson for the voice body we put to Tony Abbott in 2014. Anne's drafting showed one way a voice in the Constitution could be achieved. I signed up because the idea of the Pearson-Toomey voice proposal was political influence, not judicial veto. In my mind, those words in 2014 were never meant to be inviolable. We put out an idea to show how it could be done. It was an idea that needed to be tested, not just by lawyers, academics and activists, but in the broader political debate, debate among the Australian people. I saw it not as the final word, but very much as voice 1.0. Since that time, Anne Toomey has devised at least two other versions of provisions to enable a voice in the Constitution to help contribute to the discussion and debate. Voice 1.0 was not the only proposal. Warren Mundine and Tim Wilson were also developing an idea for local and regional voices. Their idea was an enhancement of the original idea. It was about empowering Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians in their communities right across the country, making a difference on the ground. It was for that reason, with proposals for a local and regional voice and a national body, that the Uluru Statement from the Heart speaks of voice, but not voice to Parliament. I think it's very important to say something about the bipartisan nature of the proposals for constitutional recognition back in those days. When Tony Abbott came to government, he, together with opposition leader Bill Shorten, commissioned a joint select committee to examine the work of the expert panel. Later, Abbott and Shorten met together and worked towards commissioning the Referendum Council under Mark Liebler and Pat Anderson to inquire into what Aboriginal people wanted for constitutional recognition. 
The terms of reference for the Referendum Council expressly required it to advise both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition. The Referendum Council led to the Uluru Statement from the Heart as the culmination of dialogues held with Indigenous people around the country. Following the Government's re rejection of recommendations of the Referendum Council, Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten again agreed to establish another Joint Select Committee, this time chaired by Pat Dodson and myself. Right the way through, it was a bipartisan process, with government and opposition in lockstep about the process, if not always the outcome. When Pat Dodson and I co-chaired the Parliamentary Committee inquiry into constitutional recognition in 2018, that process again was one of finding common ground. Pat and I sweated every word. We laughed, we argued, we tried to push each other towards our own positions, but we sought to find common ground. That report is the thing I'm most proud of in my time as a parliamentarian. Pat was generous with his knowledge and his time and helped educate me about the world through Indigenous eyes. That report acknowledges that there were many things we and those political constituencies we represented did not agree on, but it focused on what we could agree on. In so many places, we found that despite our differences, that our values aligned, but we had to practically deliver in a way that our various constituencies would embrace. And it wasn't just Pat that I engaged with. I travelled with Linda Burney, with Mal and McCarthy, with Warren Snowden. They were all from the other side of politics, but they were generous with their knowledge of Indigenous life and traditions, and I'll always be grateful for that. My life as a parliamentarian with a passion for Indigenous affairs is a constant journey of learning, one that's continued in more recent times, going to Alice Springs with Senator Jacinta Price and in Seduna with my friend Senator Karen Little. That Joint Select Committee recommended a process of co-design for The Voice involving Indigenous and non-Indigenous people to develop the local, regional and national elements of The Voice. And on the issue of constitutional design, we were presented with 18 different options for constitutional recognition. We didn't resolve that issue, but instead proposed that following the process of co-design, the legal form of The Voice, regulatory, legislatively and constitutionally be addressed.